Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. Yeah, you go against Bronco Jesus, and he'll chew you up with his big old chiclet teeth. And Brandon Schultz. It would be more bold at this point to say that he's not going to be a cowboy this season. Go Hawks! This is episode 211 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me out in the wild, my good buddy, Adam Emmert. That's right, Brandon. Coming to you from an undisclosed Fred Meyer parking lot <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest. So like, we're, we're getting this done, uh, even when I'm on the road, finishing up a job and uh, just killing some time out here, waiting for your ass to get here so we can go to the game on Thursday. That's Week right. one preseason. Week one preseason is here. Uh, We have our 2018 season expectations to bring to you this week. We have a game to talk about coming up against the Colts. Although, I mean, it's not like we're going to break down the Colts uh, going into a a preseason game. Although there, there's an interesting storyline developing uh, just with the fact that uh, a certain member of the Colts could play in that game. So uh, there's Mm -hmm. that to talk about. And a uh, big interview on the show this week. Yeah. We have Ben Malcolmson. He's a special assistant to Pete Carroll. Just had a new book, a launch called Walk On, where uh, he talks about his journey as a walk on onto the 2006 USC Trojans and ultimately uh, a member of the Seahawks staff working for Pete Carroll. Yeah, very cool. I'm looking forward to that conversation you had with him. Uh, it, you know, it sounds like from the little bit I've read about him and stuff, like he is very much a Pete Carroll disciple. Definitely a good dude to talk to. I think people are going to enjoy the interview. Just fair warning. We do talk about the play that shall not be talked about. Um, so prepare yourself, get yourself emotionally ready and just, you know, that you're going to have to deal with it and it'll be fine. Look, I, I appreciate the, uh, the disclaimer. Uh, I appreciate the, the upfrontness that way. Yes, I can mentally prepare to make sure that uh, I don't cry when you guys talk about it. Well, getting into the show this week, we got some news to kick off the show. Uh, Offensive lineman news. Dwayne Brown signed a three-year extension with the Seahawks. This is exciting. Uh, Yes, it's very exciting. So that that goes to show just the faith that the Seahawks have in his level of play, number one. Number two, the big thing that stuck out to me from everything that was said is that Dwayne Brown's leadership was worth the money. Like that was, that's the biggest sense I got from it was that he's going to make a gigantic difference, even maybe even more so than uh, Mike Solari. Just the idea that you have that veteran presence who can really get across the young guys, what it takes to be a all pro player on the offensive line. Locked up through 2021 uh, with his, with his signing bonus, he gets uh, 14 million guaranteed and Cha-ching. yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the, the Andrew Whitworth deal that the the Rams gave him. Of course, he's a little bit younger, so it kind of feels like a little bit of a, I don't know, the, like the Seahawks got a pretty good deal. I, I know the age is a concern being 33 this year. Uh, he'll be 36 in 2021, the final year of his deal where he's set. He'd be set to make uh, 11.5 that year. So Yeah, I mean, but you, you always look at a deal, right? And you just you basically just in your mind, you go, oh, the last year of the deal doesn't count. Guys, like, either they're going to hold out and want a new deal, or the Seahawks are going to cut you at that point, right? Like, you never get to the last year of your deal, for the most part. And the way it's structured, it it makes sense that 2020 would be the final year, because that's the last year of the signing bonus money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, they they have that option for 2021. Sure, they have the option, but just the people concerned about the age being 36, like, I have every bit of faith that Dwayne Brown is going to be a quality player to age 35, you know, the first two years of that contract. So I'm stoked about it. I think that that finally shows the commitment to the offensive line that we've all been looking for, but that's not the only commitment to the offensive line. The Seahawks made here this last week, Uh, a move that I'm probably more excited about than everybody else. And that's the Sweeze. J.R. Sweezy coming back to the team and you know, with a lot of the news that we've been hearing at a training camp with DJ Fluker, it sounds like J.R. Sweezy could be back to assuming his role as, as the starter on that offensive line. 
Yeah, well, talk to me a little bit about what you've been hearing about Fluker, because this would be news to me. The the new the word is that people that have sat in through training camp and watched Fluker, it looks like he's limping around a little bit, and they've even tried. Well, there's been some struggles with uh, Jermaine Effetti, uh, apparently benched uh, during a series of their simulation game mm. this last weekend, and. They were screwing around in practice, moving a Fetty into guard and then bringing in Isaiah Battle at the right tackle spot. So there is a little bit of uh, it, uncertainty, it seems like, with the with the right guard spot. And there's so many different guys who could really take that spot when you think about it. I mean, you've, you've got Sweezy back in the mix now. Uh, you know, there is that possibility that they could move a Fetty back inside uh, or, you know, a Fetty could end up as a backup. It just, it seems like not a whole lot of people are happy with him. You still have Jordan Roos, who is a, a backup guard and you have Riso Diambo, who's been primarily on the left side at guard, but he could move over to be on the, on the right side as well. A uh, lot of options there. It feels like there's fewer options for right tackle, right? And that's where it gets concerning is hearing you know, that a Fetty is still having the struggles here in camp. Yeah. Because, I mean, the the plan is pretty much a Fetty at right tackle. And I'm not sure that there's a, a another plan. I mean, maybe you could bump Posick over there. It seems it seems more likely based on how they've worked things in camp that it would be Isaiah Battle. And he's a four year veteran. You know, they brought him in over from I believe it was Philly the Chiefs last oh. year. Or was it Chiefs? I feel like Battle was from the Chiefs. Yes, he was. He was traded from the Chiefs last year for, See, for a pick. That goes to show you everybody, trust your gut, never trust your brain. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There's more nerve endings in your gut than in your brain. Don't look that up. But a lot of questions on the offensive line still. And I, I feel like until we get to week one, we're probably not going to know. I know there was a little bit of concern that Justin Britt tweaked his back going into that scrimmage uh, between the two, you know, the two squads. Mm-hmm. And so he, he sat out uh, from the scrimmage this past weekend. I don't know if there's too much concern with that injury. It sounds like Doug Baldwin. Uh, his knee injury, he's going to sit out the preseason, but he's going to be ready for week one. I don't worry about him. That gives all the other receivers plenty of time to figure things out amongst themselves as to who's going to be, you know, two, three, four, five out of that group. Yeah. Uh, the Baldwin injury uh, out of all the injuries I've heard about concerns me the most just because it is a multi-week injury and because he's Doug freaking Baldwin, you know, like we can't go without Doug Baldwin. And for this season to be success, success, we cannot go without Doug Baldwin. That's just the long and short of it. So uh, I hope that the amount of time that he's missing is purely precautionary. That's the story they're telling us now. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, the the one that it seems like is more serious is the injury situation with Deion Jordan. But considering he's essentially the CJ Procise of the defense, I don't know if that's a player that I really even count on going into the season. And while the the team does need help at pass rush, when you think of just the pass rushing situations with most teams around the league, and we have Frank Clark. You know you can count on that guy to to get a pass rush. It's who's going to fill out in those other spots. And whether right. it's Jordan, he seemed like the most likely candidate, but with injuries, you think it just has to fall to the guys like Rasheem Green, Marcus Smith, Jacob Martin, Brandon Jackson, one of those other guys. Yeah, yeah, all the guys with the generic names. Right. And, uh, yeah, yeah, they, I mean, these, this pass rushing core, I mean, with names like Frank Clark and, uh, you know, who's the guy I always forget? Marcus Smith. Right. Uh, That's him. Brandon Jackson. Yeah, like all the most generic names in the world. This, this will be the, it needs a new nickname for this pass rush group, and it needs to be something along the lines of like the generic rush. Especially when you have dudes like Tom Johnson in the middle, who, you know, he was the pass rusher for Minnesota last year that got a lot of, of interior pressure. So, yeah, a lot of very generic names. Yeah. So, Shamar, the other dude that came over from. Shamar uh, Stevens, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's obviously the odd man out, like literally. He's he got is. the oddest name. Yeah. The, the pass rushing group needs to be Frank Clark, Tom Johnson, Jaron Reed, I suppose, and then Marcus Smith. Those are the most four generic names of, of that group. Right. Yeah. The generic rush has a ring. I mean, you go really, from right? you go yeah. from the Legion of Boom to the, the Legion of uh, yeah. of generic. The generic sackers. Who are the top dudes going into the game against the Colts that you're going to be watching for? 
Yeah, man. There's a few dudes that uh, I'm extremely curious about. David Moore, I really want to see what all the buzz about him is. Uh, you, you just hear Pete just gush about this guy over and over and over again. So I'm super excited to see you know what he can do. Obviously, Penny, just to see if he can be that explosive back that he was in, in college. Jeez, Louise, just the whole running back crew as a whole. Yeah. Like, that's got me just jazzed, man. I, I want to see who's the guy that takes this opportunity by the horns and uh, becomes running back one. Because whoever it is, like, if they step up, they could make this offense into something that nobody wants to face in the NFL. Russell Wilson with a legitimate running game and an offensive line that they've actually invested in. And Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett and company. Good luck with that. I'm really uh, interested to see what Uncle Will brings to the table. Mm -hmm. Will Disley. Holy cow. There, I mean, but you know, honestly, I'm more curious offensively than I am defensively. I know a lot of hand wringing about all the guys that aren't there on defense, but there's one thing that I trust the most about this coaching staff and Pete Carroll. It's the idea that they can bring in about damn near anybody to play defense and they'll perform. Well, there's two guys in particular on the defensive side of the ball that I'm super intrigued by. And one of them, of course, Shaquem Griffin. Uh, to see what he'll do in that uh, weak side linebacker spot, filling in behind KJ Wright. I feel like we'll get to see him in some extended playing time just throughout the preseason. Mm -hmm. And the other guy whose name seems to be coming up is Tedrick Thompson, T2. Yeah, that's the one dude on the defense that I'm stoked about, man. Everybody's talking about T2. They released uh, Driving with G here recently. With, I watched that. With yes. KJ Wright and, and G Scott. And K.J. Wright was saying one of the dudes that he's most excited about, Tedrick Thompson. G is 100% right on the nickname. Has to stay T2. It cannot be T-squared. No, T-squared. A, a, yeah, he was spot on with that. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's the Terminator, not a math nerd. <laughs> right. Plus, yeah. then you can you can play that uh, Terminator 2, uh, you know, the... Which the, is some of the best villain music of all time, right. is it not? That drum yeah. beat for Terminator yeah. 2. do 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 Dude, I just got chills when you did that. <laughs> I no, looked around didn't. the parking lot, make sure, like, you know, some dude wasn't uh, sneaking up on me that could turn his hands into swords or something. Catfish! You know? I hear, you know, Linda Hamilton's supposed to be coming back and uh, reprising her role as Sarah Connor in another Terminator movie. Hey, good for her. Keep getting them checks. Yeah. But yeah, T2. Uh, I'm excited about that. And kind of the DB group as a whole, right? I mean, Richard Sherman being gone, Cam being gone. And obviously Earl's not there, right. even though he's not gone. You know, it's funny. I was in the mill and uh, the, the head soft filer, Cyril, really good dude. Shout out to Cyril. He was like, we were having beers after we're done. And he looked at me, he goes, oh, yeah, Earl got traded to the Cowboys. I was like, no, I didn't. He's like, no, dude, it just happened. And I haven't really had cell service all weekend. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I would have heard about that. Catfish! And uh, so I looked it up and I was like, no, no, Earl's not been traded to the Cowboys. And he's like, oh, I don't know why my wife would have said that. And I was like, that's because every Cowboys beat reporter out there is out there trying to like claim that Earl's going to be a Cowboy. Yeah. If I log on to Twitter right now and name search Earl Thomas, I will find, you know, 10 or 12 different tweets about how he was just signed by the Cowboys. But yeah, the DBs as a whole uh, is going to be super cool to watch, um, especially against uh, Andrew Luck, potentially. Yes. Andrew Luck supposed to actually be on the field now, whether or not it's for about four plays. And then they get him off the field, but sounds like he could be out there. So that's intriguing. Uh, I want to see how he throws a full size football. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very curious to that. Because after what has it been? Two years now, almost where he hasn't been on the field. Yeah, it's been a long spell. It's been long enough for everybody to recognize now that Russell Wilson is the top quarterback out of that draft. Holy crap! That is true, isn't it? Now that you go all the way back through it, it's it's indisputable. Yeah. You know, and Kirk Cousins might be vying for number two. Yeah, if Andrew Luck doesn't get back out there, he's going to lose his, his number two spot to Kirk Cousins. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, those are the things to watch at receiver. You know, you mentioned David Moore, but Keenan Reynolds has been getting a lot of run through preseason so far. You know, former Navy quarterback, uh, led the uh, what NCAA and like touchdown record when he was at Navy. Mm -hmm. Something crazy mm -hmm. like that. So, And this is for Keenan Reynolds. This is going to be his third year as a professional. And we know that oftentimes that's when receivers really start to feel a little bit more comfortable in the NFL, too. 
Yeah. So I was just curious the in the email that you got from the DOD, uh, you know, being a former Navy guy, like how many minutes they they told you we need to talk about Keenan Reynolds? Like how many uh, how many how much were you directed to talk about him, Navy guy? How much huh? Keenan Reynolds type do it am I am I bound to required, uh, yeah. required by duty to <laughs> to uh give. Yeah. You said duty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So are you doing your duty right I, now? I, I feel like I've done my duty uh, to okay, as the good. extent that it's been required. Okay. Are you not All as right, hyped cool. about him? I'm, I'm, I'm no, a he's bit. a former quarterback. I don't give a crap. Name me a former quarterback who's been amazing playing some other position. Well, the dude for the Browns was good for what, one year? Terrell Pryor? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then for he the was not year. good last year? No, and he wasn't good with us. Yeah, okay. Well, let's see if we get... Well, he was a quarterback with us, but... Maybe Antoine Randall L. Maybe Julian Elliman. That's that might be your best. Uh, he, yeah, he holds the top spot. I mean, I'd love him to prove me wrong and be amazing. Like if he wants to do that, I'm more than happy. In terms of other wide receivers, though, the other guy to to get hyped about, I saw a Hawk blogger on Twitter said that if the preseason scrimmage is any indication, uh, Jerron Brown's going to have about 300 catches this year in the offense. <laughs> Hey, that that works for me. Yeah, a, a sneaky signing. I mean, I know that we often joked about the you know the two Browns on yeah, the good Brown and the, the bad Brown, right? Um, but I always, I don't know. Jerome Brown's actually a decent player. I, I think he could totally fill in as that number three slot guy. Yeah, like that feels like a natural, natural fit. And you know, if it comes down to it, if you have Doug Baldwin, you have Tyler Lockett. Jerron Brown, if he's you know the the number three guy, and then you have Brandon Marshall making the team, that really only leaves one other wide receiver spot, and that number five spot, you know whether it's Amar Darbo or David Moore, that's not a guy who gets a ton of catches anyway, unless there's an injury. Unless Darbo lights it the fuck up this preseason, mm-hmm. I don't think he's making the team. I don't know. It seems just hearing from Pete, it sounds like David Moore seems more like the guy than it does Darbo. I don't think there's anything that he does spectacularly well. I don't know if we've seen enough of him to know. I think the fact that we haven't seen much of him tells you about everything. He can't even make his way onto the field. I, I'm a little bit surprised that he made it on the team after last year, but I can't imagine. Well, I think, I think with a you know, draft, what was he, fourth or third round? He was round three. Round three? Okay. Yep, and around so, three. Yeah, uh, you know, a third round guy. You know, he showed enough to make the team, and then you're going, all right, let's see what happens with this guy when the year two leap is supposed to happen. And if it doesn't happen then, then, okay, well, then we're making room for an undrafted guy or, you know, somebody who's really proven it. But you give him that one off season to try to get it together. I feel like after this preseason, we'll have a significant enough picture to, to make a decision on him. Uh, I want to go through some of some people on Twitter have been going around with uh, some of the, uh, you know, comeback player, dark horse MVP type candidates. I want to run through this list. I even threw in a couple extra uh, for you and me to to kind of identify who we think, you know, because this is our, our 2018 expectations. Right. Who we think will will fill out these groups. And the number one spot is the breakout star that you see from the Seahawks in 2018. Yeah, for me, it's Shaquille Griffin. Yeah. You know, playing uh, Richard Sherman's old spot. I know he's going to get tested and I know he's super talented and I know he's good at, you know, his job. So, uh, Shaquille, he's my, he's my guy for breakout star. I think he's the guy that people on NFL network are being like, man, this is the reason they let Richard Sherman go. They knew they had a real stud here in, in, in Shaquille. For me, and this one is kind of, I feel like we already know about him, but the rest of the league hasn't quite caught on yet. And that's because with with Michael Bennett being gone, with Cliff Averill retiring, I think this is going to be the year that Frank Clark really solidifies himself as a star in the league. And you know, potentially because he, he hasn't made a Pro Bowl, uh, but this is this this will be the year for him. And uh, Frank Clark will be my b- breakout star on the defense. I think it's a pretty solid choice coming up on a contract year. Like if you were ever to be motivated as a player. Um, this would be it. You know, if he makes a name for himself, I mean, outside of Seattle right. this year and gets into that 15 sack range and is just a terror, he's going to make himself a lot of money. Back up the brink truck, man. He's one of those guys where I'd, I'd feel more comfortable if they signed him now 
as opposed to waiting. But if he's going to, if I'm Frank Clark's agent, there is no way in hell I'm signing a deal right now. And that's the other side of it, right? Sorry, Frank, you're playing out this year. Yeah. You're going to make more money if you do. Yep. Comeback player. Easy for me. It's got to be Tyler Lockett. He was showing it toward the end of last season. And that makes it, you know, with, with Jimmy Graham gone, with Paul Richardson gone, he's in clear position to, to really show it on both special teams. Uh, well, and to be a comeback player of the year, didn't you need to either have A, a Catfish. year before or B, not play? I feel like he's still coming back from that injury. It still counts. This is a stretch, your comeback player of the year. That's like me saying, that's like me saying Russell Wilson's going to be the comeback player of the year after two seasons ago suffering all those ankle and knee injuries. Yeah. Okay. If that's who you want to pick. He's just getting back. He's just getting back. It's Russell Wilson. Are you trying to put rules on me? Are you saying that my comeback player that I, I should pick somebody else? Yeah. I think it's illegitimate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My comeback player this year after being out for half a season last year, not even playing and then coming in toward the end of the season and kind of looking like the guy that we remember, Byron Maxwell. He'll be the, yeah. the number two cube, the number two the corner uh, behind Shaq Griffin, and he'll be able to kind of hold down that other side, just like he did toward the end of the season last year. Just like he did for us uh, before he left for the Eagles. So uh, that, there you go. Now that's legit. <laughs> All right. I can, I can endorse that. I think my comeback player this year is for Deion Jordan, and I understand that the injury news right now isn't great about him, I, I didn't even know exactly what it was. Like Pete is saying something like he had stress things in his leg. Like he didn't, he didn't <laughs> do anything. A stress like, issue. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, his leg's a little stressy right now. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, what does that mean? I don't know. But granted that he can come back from that. And I think he will. I think they're uh, being hyper cautious with that. Now, here's a guy with all the talent in the world. Um, you saw glimpses of it last year when he finally made it back to the field guy with everything in the world to prove this is his opportunity i think Dion jordan is going to be the comeback player of the year for the seahawks the rising star out of this group of seahawks i'm gonna go with chris carson i think chris carson is going to be the rising star if we saw him really perform given his shot last year i think the offensive line is better for him to run behind this year a new emphasis on the running game i think he's going to be rb number one I don't see Penny beating him out, especially with his pass protection issues. I don't see Pro Size being able to stay healthy. Pete loves him. I think Chris Carson's a guy, and I think he has a monster year. And uh, for all the hand wringing about how the defense has taken a step back, I think what will balance that out will be the offense being much more productive than it was prior. Ethan Posick's got to be the rising star for me. I think this is a guy who on the offensive line, we've been looking for a player to really jump out. And Dwayne Brown, you know, he's he's been around. He's been a pro bowler. But I think settling in in between Justin Britt and Dwayne Brown, that after a, a year of offseason work on the offensive line, I think Ethan Posick could be that guy to really solidify that left guard spot. And I don't know how much of on the radar an offensive guard can get, but I think going into year two, I, I think we're going to, I think we're going to like that spot and running toward that left side of the line. It won't be like, you know, 2005 Seahawks, but right. it might start to resemble that a little bit. So you're not saying he's going to be Steve Hutchinson. No, but. Okay. But at but, least we'll have, we'll go, okay, that left side of the line, we have competent yeah. guys that we can run that direction and, and be good with. We can usually move people on the left side. Yeah. Uh, and you say the idea that a guard would be able to get enough spotlight to, you know, kind of get the recognition. But I think when it comes to the Seahawks offensive line, that that is a position that could definitely get a lot of shine because everybody loves dogging it, right? Like it, me, myself included. And so when a guy comes in and performs like, I think you're going to get a lot of shine. Well, in the don't forget about category, I've got to put Jaron Reed in there going into his third year <laughs> toward the middle of the defensive line. Just kind of been a solid run stopper and he could take a step and, and maybe get a little bit of a pass rush too. But the guy that takes those, the, the double teams on the offensive line and still shines, I, I feel like we have to mention his names. Those defensive tackles, they just, they get, tend to get overlooked at how much of a difference they can be. So don't forget about Jaron Reed. No, I, I think that's a, an excellent pick. Um, you know, hearing guys talk about Jaron Reed and the type of role that he's assumed this year, uh, with, other veterans being uh, let go or injured and, and off the team. I think, yeah, he's, he's kind of become a team leader and I think he could be 
a big part of the success up front this year because I really do like this group, this defensive tackle or whole defensive line group as a whole. I really do. I feel great about it. I don't know if I feel great. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you got a bunch of dudes who can actually who can play. And when you have a deep group, I think what's been proven over the last few years is that having because we had the year where you know we just had studs all up front, right? Yeah. But it was just first team guys who were studs and not a lot behind them. And you see teams like the Eagles who have a couple studs, but then just a bunch of dudes who can play that you're constantly rotating in and can be fresh. A guy who can just play but is fresh in the fourth quarter is better than a stud who's gasped in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And that's why I'm excited about that defensive line group. The don't forget about this dude uh, nominee that uh, I have for this year is Tyler Lockett. And I think that's where he fits in. Yeah. Because – you know, after his rookie year, you had everybody talking about, oh, draft him in fantasy. He's the man, da 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 And like you said, had a hard time coming back from that injury last year, but still showed the Tyler Lockett flashes, especially towards the end. Uh, I think Tyler Lockett is going to be a game breaker this year. Someone that needs to rebound this year. The need to rebound category, it's got to be Jermaine Effetti. Because yeah. as we talked about before, at right tackle, really... In terms of his talent, it feels like he has the talent to fill out that spot. And he's had a rough couple of years and one at guard, one at tackle. And finally, this is his third year. He needs to put it together. Even in the scrimmage, he's, he's committing penalties. He's got to get the, the penalty issues behind him. And he needs to be a guy who can be competent on the right side of the line. I, we don't need him to be great. Just be an average dude. That's that's yeah. all we need on that side. I'm actually glad you chose a Fetty. That would have been exactly my choice. In fact, it was my choice. So let me just uh, uh, jump on the get it together a Fetty bandwagon. Because um, I, I think you're 100% right. Everything you said is spot on regarding him. Who's your dark horse MVP candidate for this year? I mean, obviously, Russell Wilson, you know, he, he would be the, the white horse candidate. Right. We, need, we need a dark horse MVP. I'm going to give you Earl Thomas. And the reason I say that is the idea that let's say his holdout does last into the regular season, two, three weeks, you know, something like that. And the Seahawks really struggle out of the gate. And then Earl Thomas comes back and they go on a tear and like rattle off 10 wins or something like that. You could, you could start hearing some Earl Thomas for MVP buzz. No doubt about it. I could see that the, the other guy that I would pick in this spot, Chris Carson. I feel yeah. like a lot of people, you know, with Rashad Penny being the number one pick, but in terms of when you talk about a guy who can deliver the type of pounding that the yes. Seahawks like the physical nature at running back, I think Carson could be that guy. And, and every indication that I just listening to the interviews with him, uh, hearing about the, the type of work that he's put in, in the off season, if he comes out, and can stay healthy and can be that guy that is handling the ball in between the guards, in between the tackles and, and punishing dudes. I think Carson could be your, your dark horse MVP. Oh, heck yeah. I mean, just change the entire tone of the offense, right? Just like beast did He'll come in and be that, you know, it, it, nobody's going to be as intimidating as Marshawn, no. right? But just be a guy that when the Seahawks come into town, the defenders on the opposite team go, Man, I better, I better snap both snaps on the chin strap this week because yeah, Chris Carson's coming to town and he could definitely be that guy. Well, this next one isn't one that was going around on Twitter, but I feel like, uh, with, with what we've talked about in the past, uh, it's important to, to add a category for the best looking player out of oh. the, out of the team because, you know, now that, you know, you were on the Paul Richardson train last year. Yeah. I was yeah. on, I was behind Cam Chancellor. Not a poor choice. Not a Bo- poor choice. Both those guys gone. Who yeah. who is left who to to take on the mantle as the most handsome Seahawks player? I think I'm gonna go with Doug Baldwin. I, I he was he was in my top four of guys to okay. choose b- between. I had All Baldwin. Right. Uh, you got Tanner McAvoy. Yeah, it was hard for me to not pick Tanner, but I just don't know that he's gonna make the team. Yeah, uh, you got Bobby Wagner. I feel like he doesn't get enough run. Nah, no, he's not in that. No, he's not. I picked KJ before I picked Bobby. Really? Just okay. on, yeah, just just enhance some stats. Yeah, 
I hope Bobby doesn't hear this. <laughs> I feel like KJ is just like more chill. I mean, they're both pretty chill guys. Yeah. And I think that that maybe adds to that factor for him. Okay. You know who I'm going to give it to, though? I'm going to give it to Brandon Marshall. Oh, yeah. That's solid choice, actually. And I don't know yeah. if it's just, you know, the TV star persona that he already has. Um, he's got an awesome smile. Uh-huh. He's very symmetrical. <laughs> like, yeah. B. Marsh is, is legit on the on the handsome scale. Yeah. I could see him breaking a lot of little Lady 12's hearts. And plus, he has a, a super awesome first name. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty generic one. He could, he could star on the generic sack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pass rush. Oh, great. Is my name a generic first name now, finally? Is it not? I don't, I don't and, know. And, and, and you know how I'm qualified to speak on this? <laughs> my name is Adam. <laughs> the very first name ever, supposedly. <laughs> and uh, yeah. There's nothing more generic than that. Yeah, I suppose when there's already two Brandons on the team with Brandon Jackson and Brandon Marshall. Yeah, it's not like your name is Malik. <laughs> like, are you serious? You're like, is Brandon generic? Or, or, yeah, it's or generic. Or Yeah, the, there's no, there's no uh, apostrophes in your name. You're not a Debrickasha. Don't fool yourself. Yeah. Okay. Just because you spell it screwed up <laughs> doesn't mean doesn't mean that it made it unique. That's like. <laughs> You know, people who name their kids, you know, what what was the uh, Caitlin, and they spell it like fifteen different ways, right? They're like, oh no, it's Caitlin with a K Y, and you know, and two T's. Matter, still, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's still Caitlin. Okay, might as well be Jessica. All right. Well, that, <laughs> I think that does it for our look at the 2018 <laughs> Seahawks, and in, in terms of categories, but in terms of ex- expectations. And we've t- we've covered this pretty well, but because this is our expectation show, yes. we got to put it on the record here. I'm going to go first on this because my expectations for the first time this year are not they're not playoffs. I, I don't I can't definitively say, yes, the Seahawks going into this year are the favorites to win the division, because I do think to to an extent that the Rams and they they should be favored just based on their personnel, you know, with Marcus Peters coming in with with uh, head case. I, I, I understand. And Donald can sue head case. Head case. But I do. keep to leave head case. <laughs> yeah. But Wade Phillips, if if anybody can can make all no, those guys and no, pull them together, no, he no, can be no. the guy. Absolutely not. I about fell out of my chair when the Rams uh, pod dude said that uh, Wade Phillips would be the dude to rein it in with all the crazy personalities. Are you kidding me? The expectation he, is there. The, not that they're going to run away with it, but they they're the favorites. In my mind, they should be the favorites to win the division based on all the personnel, based on you know Todd Gurley's performance last year, uh, bringing in Brandon Cooks. They should be the favorites. Now, I don't know if it's going to play out that way, but I, I still feel I don't know if there's really any team that I look at and say for sure that team's finishing on the bottom because I like the Arizona Cardinals defense more than I do the You're 49ers so defense. You're I, so weird. I like their I like their running back uh, better with David Johnson. I don't think the Cardinals are going to finish last, and I I do think there's probably going to be two or three teams that are pretty close together going into that last month of December. So I don't have the expectations for playoffs, but it's not going to surprise me. And I do think a lot of other people are underrating this t- the the Seahawks. Yeah, my expectations are very different than yours um, because I. When I look at this Seahawks roster, I look at the major changes that were made in some serious areas that needed to be addressed. And I see nothing but an offense that is going to be much better than it was last year in every aspect, especially the running game. You get a little bit of a running game going, which they have all the pieces to do it and look out. Because Russell Wilson now with the running game compared to what he was, you know, in his second or third year in year seven you know, with a running game, look out. Because I think my expectation is with the improvements on the offensive line, with Chris Carson healthy and being a thumper that he is, especially with the depth that we have at running back to deal with injuries, you know, whether that is Penny who comes in or Pro Size or McKissick. Uh, we have a bunch of dudes that can really play and give them a little bit of daylight. They're going to take a lot of pressure off Russell Wilson. And because of that, 
One of my expectations for this year is Russell Wilson to be a legitimate MVP candidate that everybody is talking about in the nation. Not an MVP candidate in our minds as Seattle fans, but as a national MVP candidate. In fact, the type of candidate where they look at one guy or Russell Wilson, they'd be like, pick one or the two, and I'm fine with it. I understand your choice. I think he's going to have that kind of year. Lead the Seahawks to 10-6, and six, the Rams finishing 8-8, eight and eight, with the Niners finishing probably about the same, 8-8, eight, eight and 9-7. Eight, and seven. Then you have the Cardinals hopefully winning four games because I have no clue what you see in the Cardinals. It makes zero sense to me whatsoever. This is a league that is about quarterbacks, and clearly they have the worst quarterback in the division, whether that's Sam Bradford or rookie Josh Rosen. They're going nowhere fast this year. So those are my expectations this year, is that the running game is going to come alive, that this offense is going to be better, and that the defense will suffer the losses that they did uh, personnel-wise this offseason and still be a top-10 defense and really surprise t- people. I think the whole league is sleeping on the Seattle Seahawks, especially with the idea that the Hawks have that chip on their shoulder and now not having the target on their back. I think it's right where they want to be. I love the position that this team is in. And a division win, a playoff appearance, and then we'll see what happens. I, I can't give you any playoff predictions, but definitely a division win and a playoff berth. If we were going to rank the division finishers in terms of the the quarterback and how I yeah. felt at, at quarterback for each team, clearly the Seahawks would be number one. Uh, San Francisco would probably be number two. I would actually put the Cardinals with a healthy Sam Bradford at number three, but that would be like, dude, stop trying to stop trying to say Sam Bradford's good. This is like, did you also get a, a email from the University of Oklahoma today, Mister Boomer, sooner saying that you needed to give Sam Bradford a little love? I'll he take, stinks. I'll take a he healthy stinks. Sam Bradford over Jared Goff. Oh hell no! I'm not saying that 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 mythical creature exists, but that's what I would select. Wow. You don't know how to judge quarterbacks if you do that. There's no way in hell I'd take uh, that number one pick of a quarterback, Sam Bradford, over Jared Goff, the number one pick as a quarterback. There's no F and Y, especially in that's in the schemes that they're in. Dude, you're out of your mind. You know, I don't think you're that far off, though, with 10 and 6 for the Seahawks. If I had to pick a record, I, I think that would be a, a good record to pick for me. It's just that I think I would I'd go ahead and pick the Rams at 11 and 5. I would pick the uh, Arizona Cardinals to go seven and nine, and I'm going to say San Francisco goes six and ten. Dude, it, this this Rams hype needs to stop even coming out of your mouth, dude. Like you've you've been you've been reading too many articles this off season. There has never been a case in the history of football that the superstar team, you know, the the off season winner, right in the in the salary cap era, has been the juggernaut everybody predicted especially with the year for the league to adjust to Sean McVay, especially with all the knuckleheads that they brought in, especially with the fact that the guy who's tasked to keep it all together basically could throw a frat party tomorrow and blend in because he's 13 years old, their head coach, McVay. Like, and then the idea that Wade Phillips is going to be the savior that is the disciplinarian that pulls it all together. you got to be Catfishing. kidding me. Wade Phillips throughout his career has always been the giant teddy bear pushover everywhere he's been everywhere. He let Ralph Wilson, the owner of the Buffalo Bills, make him bench Doug Flutie in the playoffs to put in Rob Johnson. We're, this is the man we're talking about. And on top of all of that, Wade Phillips has never had any success outside of Denver. And is L.A. Denver? No, it is not. This Rams team is so freaking overhyped. It is crazy. And you're trying to tell me Brandon Cooks is an upgrade over Sammy Watkins? Are we sure that's the truth? I don't know if he's an upgrade. So you just stayed the same. Look, I'm not. I'm just saying, just when the Rams go back to their rightful place as, as being a 500 team and finish 8-8, eight and eight, I'll be the first one to say I told you so, and it's going to be a lot of freaking fun. The, the, car, the stars are so aligned for this. So who was that disciplinarian then on the Denver Broncos team? Because they had some dudes who were a little the Coobs. bit. Yeah. Gary Kubiak. And not only that, and it was John Elway. Well, yeah. I, now I know Elway could be a disciplinarian. Yeah. You go against Bronco Jesus yeah. and he'll chew you up with his big old chiclet teeth. <laughs>
I think I just found the drop for the opener for the show. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. All right, dude. Well, what do you say we get to uh, this interview with Ben Malcolmson of the Seahawks talking about how he went from playing in the fifth grade uh, about the time you and I started playing football, Adam, uh, mm-hmm. played for one year and then ultimately made it on to the, the USC Trojans 2006 team and actually became a member of the team just with one year of football experience. Very cool. I'm looking forward to hearing this story. This week, we bring on Ben Malcolmson, special assistant to Seahawks head coach Pete Carroll. And Ben was a member of the 2006 USC Trojans who beat the number three Michigan Wolverines in the Rose Bowl that year. Ben, how are you doing? Doing great, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me on. So, Ben, you wrote a book here recently titled Walk On. And, well, I, I was thinking it would be a great book for our audience to read. But then it starts out with the uh, Super Bowl 49. And now I, I'm not I'm not so sure I want to recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's it was a very therapeutic thing for me to to write it out and get it out there, and um, I think it'll help a lot of people kind of move through that. That was a that was a heartbreaking time for a lot of us, and we're still kind of dealing with that. When someone mentions the the game in Phoenix or Super Bowl Forty Nine, I mean, it still kind of tweaks your heart a little bit. And there's just so much pain associated, but. There, there's some pretty amazing things in that part of the of the book. Just starting off there, and just, I mean, Coach Carroll's leadership uh, abilities in that moment, just in one of the lowest moments of a, of a football player, football coach's tenure, his, his career, and then to see what Coach did in that moment was just incredible. So I figured I had to start that way, um, especially with just the emotion that's wrapped up in there. And yeah, it was a, it was just a incredibly profound moment. So it was really really powerful. As hard as it is for even fans to get over, I, I can't even imagine, you know, being a part of it and being that closely connected. I think the the devastation, I think it's pretty similar <laughs> for, for both of us. Totally. That, and that's the cool thing about the Seahawks and the 12s is that there's this bond that that the fans have with the team that's unlike any other sport. It's It's even far different than like a college you know where you're an alumni of a college and you feel this affiliation with your school but the the bond and the the chemistry that the 12s have with this team is so unique and that's what makes it so special and that's what made winning the super bowl so great was because the 12s caused the first two points of the game you know 12 seconds into the game there's a safety because the broncos hadn't prepared for the the sound at a neutral site game yeah. and that's the 12s and then i literally 364 days later we're we're sitting there in Phoenix and the twelves just as much as all of us get their hearts ripped out. And that's, I mean, we, we have to live with the, the ups and the downs with that, but it's so special. Um, and we feel it on, on game days. We feel it throughout the week. I mean, you go into the grocery store on a Tuesday and people are wearing Seahawks stuff, you know, that's, that doesn't happen in other places with other teams. And it's just a really, really special thing to be a part of. So you mentioned Coach Carroll's leadership after that moment. What was it that he said to the team that, that really resonated with you? Yeah, I mean, the that, that interception happened with, what, 20 seconds left in the game or whatever it was. And then the Patriots go and take two knees and then we're going to the locker room. So from the time that interception happened to the time that the team is in the locker room, it's, it's maybe five minutes of real time. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what could Coach Carroll possibly say? You know, like he's never experienced something like this. No one ever has, you know, and what could he possibly say in this moment to help this team out? And he gets there in front of the locker room and he says, hey, guys, if you're going to point any fingers, you point them at me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what happened there. I take I take all the, the blame on this one. And it was just an incredible moment of leadership because the buck stopped with him. He didn't blame he, he, anyone else. He, he wasn't the one that called the play. He wasn't the one that ran the route or threw the pass. But he took all the blame on it. And because he is the leader, the buck stopped with him. And, and that um, changed my life because I saw what a, a true leader does in, in the moment of hardship that he can kind of take that, you know. And, and that was just incredible. Um, and it was really special to see. Well, one of the cool things about reading your book, Ben, was just you kind of documenting your experiences with Coach Carroll from uh, your time at USC as a student through your time on the team and then even, you know, hearing about some of those moments in Seattle. But I want to go back because I've, I've read the whole book now and I still don't know if I have a good answer for this. How is it that a guy playing football in the fifth grade 
and only in the fifth grade, ends up making the football team, that, that 2006 USC Trojan football team? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that, but uh, I think that's just one of those things that was out of my control, and it was just kind of uh, divine providence there. But, I mean, I, I played football that one year in fifth grade and was miserable. I hated it. I was trying to quit throughout the season, but my dad, in that kind of that like fatherly wisdom moment for him, was like, you're not going to quit. Something that you start, you're going to finish it off and you're never going to quit. You're not going to be a quitter. And so he kind of instilled that in me as much as I hated it in the moment, as much as I wanted to quit in the moment. Um, but it kind of s- stuck that into into my head and my heart. And uh, I finished that season out and then I immediately stopped playing football and said I never, was never going to play football ever again. And then I find myself my senior year of college. I was a, a journalism major. I was writing for the Daily Trojan, the school newspaper there, and I'd covered the football team for three years. And this was the glory days of USC where they were number one year in and year out and all the Heisman trophies and almost three straight national championships. And I mean, just an incredible time to, to be a student reporter, you know, and, and there I am um, covering the team and I get an idea that I should do a story on the walk-ons on the team, the guys that are kind of end of the bench. They're not the ones on the cover of Sports Illustrated or, or on Sports Center every night. But they helped fill out the team, and, and the team wouldn't be able to run without these guys. So I figure I'll start writing a story about these guys. And, and through that process, I see that they have walk-on tryouts for any student that goes to USC. So, I mean, just like an open casting call for any student at USC. And I was, I was thinking to myself, this is a pretty rare opportunity that the number one football team in the country just lets any student try out that's attending USC. Mm -hmm. And so it hits me, well, why don't I go through the tryout and go through it first person perspective, write a story from that angle. This will be pretty unique. And it would, it'll be a joke too, because as you know, I I hadn't played football since fifth grade. I was a skinny little newspaper reporter and this was the number one football team in the country. So it was going to be a total joke. I could make fun of myself and uh, go through the tryout. And it literally was going to be the best article I ever had. I mean, this was unbelievable. I got to go through tryouts for the top football team in the country coach carroll's there ken norton jr's there all these well-known assistant coaches are there and there i am just a a schmuck going through the tryout (laughs) and i I get home that night i start writing my story i mean this was the crown jewel of my college newspaper career i mean i was so excited to write this story and i get a phone call two days later saying i made the football team now (laughs) i was blown away because there's no way I could have made the football team. I mean, it never even it never even crossed my mind that I could make the team. Yeah, it was you all know, for was, the story, right? Yeah, that was my only intention, and it was there wasn't even like a dream of oh, this could happen. I mean, it's like someone like you dreaming oh, someone's going to walk through my front door and hand me a million dollars. You know, it's like that's that just doesn't happen. You know, and you could dream about it, but it's almost too big to even dream about. You know, but this was one of those moments where it was like okay, I didn't even like think this was a possibility. I could never even dream something like this. And here I am all of a sudden on the the football team at USC. And uh, I mean, you can imagine that I I figured it had to be a prank. And (laughs) as you know, Coach Carroll is renowned for pulling pranks. And so um, I was just like, oh, man, he's got to be pulling a prank on me. So I I went to the football office and I was like, Coach, prank's over. Like, (laughs) just just break the news to me. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, you can catch the ball. You can run fast. We want you on the team. Are you in? And there I was, senior in college, trying to rationalize everything, trying to make sense of everything. And I was like, of course, let's go. And so, I mean, in that moment, my life took a total turn and I'm still living in the wake of that today. One of the wild stories about it to me, too, was when you went to the tryout and only having that experience from fifth grade. I mean, how did, how did you even have any idea what position you were going to try out for? <laughs> That's the funny part. Um, in fifth grade, I played defensive line because uh, it's kind of like in Little League Baseball, they kind of put the, the struggling athletes into right field, you know, where they can kind of hide them in the, in the outfield. And they put the struggling Pop Warner players on defensive line because you're going to have linebackers and cornerbacks and everyone, and you're just, just trying to fill up space. So I played defensive line and I don't know if you're trying to make me feel bad, Ben, because that's where I played in my one year of football in sixth grade, too. So, (laughs) hey, we can commiserate in that that regard. Um, But I mean, and and every player in in my league in Pop Warner had to play four plays minimum. And then, of course, I played four plays. So 
I was I was the the weakest of the weak, you know. I was undersized and everything. So I'm there ten years later trying out for the number one football team in the country, and they ask what position you you want to be as you you sign in on the tryout sheet. And I put my name and position. I'm like, oh gosh, like I don't know what to try. Obviously not defensive line. I'm 165 pounds. And so what am I going to be? I put wide receiver question mark. Because it's like, I I guess, you know, just kind of like Ron Burgundy at the at the teleprompter, you know, like wide receiver. I don't really know. <laughs> so they, they throw, me, throw me in with some wide receiver drills. And I'm glad that I put the, that position there. It worked out for you. You end up making the team, but then uh, you get injured. Yeah, so I I was obviously um, out of my league. I mean, on, on that team, there were uh, 50-something guys that ended up playing the NFL. So it was literally an entire NFL roster of players were on that team, which is just crazy. I'm on the first-round draft pick. Clay Matthews is on that team. Um, all these incredible athletes were on that team. And um, I'm out there just trying to figure out how to put pads on first and foremost, you know, try to read a playbook. And all these things are just so hard for me. And – uh, about a month into practice during the spring, I'm out there and I, I get tangled up in a, in a play and I dislocate my shoulder and I have to be out and they send me to the hospital and I have to get um, major reconstructive uh, surgery on my shoulder and uh, I'm out. They said I'm gonna, it's going to take nine months to recover. And so nine months from that point was well after the football season was going to be over. And it was crushing because I'd started to believe that I could do this and started to believe that this was a reality, my new reality, you know, and, and, uh, I, I'm going through rehab and I just devoted myself to rehab and just thought I could get back. And that was something I learned from coach was that, that you kind of have the power, you know, and, and you've seen, you've seen that with a lot of our players today with the Seahawks is, I mean, the, the doctors will be like, oh, you're out for six to eight weeks with whatever, you know, and, and you get players that come back in three or four weeks. And it's some it's this belief that Coach Carroll instills in his players. It's like you have the power, you know, like you can if you want to get back sooner, you can. And it's not just with injuries. It's with everything. You know, you're, you're down two touchdowns in a game. If you want to come back, you can. And and coach instills that in that, that belief into players. And so he instilled that into me right, almost right away. And. I just started to believe that I could get back sooner than nine months. And I was back in, in four months, which when the doctors cleared me to return, they're like, we can't even believe we're doing this, but yeah, you're, you're good to go. So I was back. It was kind of miraculous healing. And uh, I was back on the team. As wild as the story is of you making the team, the story of you kind of fighting your way to get back on the team after being injured and really let go from the team to making it on the field. Yeah, for some reason, uh, I just kind of latched onto this. And I, I think a lot of it was tied in with me knowing that I, I was there for a reason and that I was there for a purpose. And I was just just hungry to figure out what it was. And I knew that I wasn't there to, to really play football. You know, <laughs> like the chances of me playing in a game were, were slim to none. Um, but I just felt like I was I was part of something that was really meaningful and really purposeful. And I, I just wanted to, to get back as I just desperately wanted to get back. And then work to every little nook and cranny of my life to get back on that on that team and get healthy. And um, I'm so glad that I kind of had that fire inside of me then. That um, looking back, it's like it, I don't know if I could have really conjured that up myself, but it was just kind of in me, you know, and, and brought me back on that team. And, and here we are, what 12 years later, still living in the light of that. Well, and the purpose did come to you, and, and it's revealed by the end of the book. And I, I don't want to give it away for folks, but I do want to give a warning that if you listen to the audio version, uh, maybe hold off on that last chapter and uh, when you're not at work. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an emotional moment. And uh, I, I want to go back, Ben, to, uh, you know, it, with you kind of going through the, the tryouts and the walk-on process, you know, with Seahawks training camp going on right now. Are there any of those guys whose stories kind of resonate with you in particular, kind of the underdog type stories that, that you see coming through training camp? Oh, totally. And that's the beautiful thing about, about this team year after year is that there's so many underdog stories on it. And I think a lot of that is a product of, of Coach Carroll and John Schneider. They, they want guys that are kind of the underdogs that have the chip on the shoulder and that, that have that grit. You know, the guys that have battled through a lot of adversity to get to where they are. Um, and it's, it could be like a former first rounder, you know, like Dion Jordan, who's like number three pick a couple of years ago. And he's had to battle through so many injuries just to get back. And he's got this fire inside of him, this grit 
that has brought him back to this place where he he could do something really special. And then of course, I mean, you have the the mainstays like Doug Baldwin. You know, like he was an undrafted free agent his rookie year that goes on to lead the team in receiving his rookie year as an undrafted. Like that is just so mind blowing in the NFL. And then here he is, what eight or nine years later still still battling you know and still just a leader on this team and on on field production and off the field too and it's guys like that and i mean this this rookie class there's so many guys that are just so exciting to see and it's so early in the process and i can't wait for games to start and uh just to start to see guys really step up and shine um it's just it's such a cool team to be a part of because every year there's there's a couple of those stories that happen and it's half the team every year is undrafted guys that are just fighting, you know, like you, you, we had Jermaine curse a few years ago, um, guys like that, that are just, they, they come from, from nothing and they just turn into just amazing contributors to this team. Well, you know, I, as I watch training camp, um, I, I kind of, and, and just reading the book too, I kind of put myself in your shoes and two of the things that really resonated with me as you were going through tryouts and then, you know, just working with the team, uh, being a part of the team, uh, those two ideas of, of focusing on not embarrassing yourself and, <laughs> and the fear of getting hit. Like those two things <laughs> that really resonated. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think we've all found ourselves in places that we feel like we don't really belong. And uh, we definitely didn't earn our way there. And so you kind of have that fear of, oh, man, I, I might get found out here. You know, I might I might embarrass myself. And, and so I was definitely wrestling with that um, throughout that process. And then getting hit, I mean, man, I didn't know what it was going to feel like to take a hit. Because you watch it on TV and you see it live in person in games and it's it's violent you know you hear the sound of the pads hitting and i mean just it just looks brutal and so i didn't really know if i could if i could take a hit and and actually walk off the practice field you know i thought i might i might uh have some serious repercussions for the rest of my life but that first hit comes and i'm laying there on the ground of of course i i didn't take it very well i was face down on the ground and i kind of come to my senses and I'm, I'm realizing that all my limbs are intact, nothing hurt too bad. And I was going to survive. And so it was kind of a moment of triumph for me because it was like, wow, I, I might be able to do this. Here we go. And then of course, a few plays later, I take another hit and I'm lying there on the ground <laughs> just in pain. Um, but I'm, I'm just grateful that, that I got to experience that for just, and just survive it. You know, <laughs> it was, it was a pretty triumphant moment. Well, including uh, getting a uh, taking a big hit from future NFL linebacker Ray Maluga. Yeah, I uh, I took a lot of hits from him. I think I was kind of like a tackling dummy for him. He he really enjoyed uh, letting his his vengeance out on me. <laughs> I don't know what I did to deserve it, but uh, thankfully he's a great guy and just an amazing, just a fun loving teammate and all that. And um, he definitely when he, when it was practice time, it was like a game for him. He was he was a warrior and. He did not hold back at all. And so, I mean, there were times, I mean, I'm on scout team kickoff return and I'm going against Ray Maluga. So I've got to turn around, run down the field, 30 yards, flip around and try to block him. And he's coming at me at a, what, four four forty. you know, it's just, I, I've got no chance at all. So I'm, many of those times I would just get leveled and it was funny, uh, looking back, it wasn't funny in the moment, but we'd be watching film the next day in meetings and, um, I mean, there's 22 guys on the football field, obviously, at a time. And I'm just hoping I escape without people seeing me just get leveled, you know, like a cardboard box. And I'm there in meetings, and I see one where I just get destroyed. And I'm just so thankful. The guys, they must have watched the ball, or they must have watched another player, uh, player on that field. But they kind of skipped over me, and the coach goes to the next – cut up and all the players are, whoa, whoa, whoa hold, hold up go back go back and they they go back to to me being kind of the tackling dummy and and they watch it three or four or five or six times in a row and they're getting sound effects into it and they're just rolling on the floor laughing because i did not look like a football player at all in those moments <laughs> But you, but you made it. And as humbling as that experience may have been, I mean, you have, you have that, that, you know, entire season that you're with the team. And then you even have that moment. And really, it's an incredible story of how you ultimately get into the game against the number six Notre Dame fighting Irish. Yeah, yeah. And so last home game of the year and a bunch of students had started a campaign called Get Ben In. And they made T-shirts and put up signs all over campus. And they were 
we had a huge sign behind college game day. And I mean, they, they made it their mission to get me in the game because in a way I kind of represented the, just the average normal student, you know, and there I was, uh, we went through a couple of our last home games and never got a chance to play. And I'm thinking that, I mean, really the only chance I can get into a game is if we're up what 50 points, you know, they're not going to put a scrub little last string wide receiver in on the, in, in a game until we're up a ton of points. And there's a lot of guys that deserve to play ahead of me that, that were kind of backups and all that. And so we're playing Notre Dame, our last home game of the year at the Coliseum, 92,000 fans, national TV, primetime game. And we're number three in the country. And uh, we're there and we go up 20 points and our coaches figure it's time to put Ben in. So they, they yell my name out. I run out of the field. I, I, it was funny because it was the quarterback kneel. There wasn't any cinematic touchdown game winning play or anything like that. It was just the quarterback kneel. So <laughs> um, I couldn't have messed that up, but it is funny because I did mess it up. I didn't line <laughs> up right. And so um, the coaches were razzing me pretty hard for that. It's like the one play you go in, you don't line up right. Come on. But I was just, I was so lost in the moment. And uh, it was just, it was a pretty magical experience, especially with, just all the support that had gone behind and the, the student section was chanting, get Ben in. And it was, uh, it was just so, so cool. And just really cool to, to be a part of something that was bigger than me. You know, it wasn't just a uh, me and, and that's it. It was, it was so many people had gotten behind it and then rallied and, and contributed. And it was really fun. Well, Ben, Really want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, great story. Where can folks go and find the book and where can they follow you online if they, if they want to follow you? Yeah, the book's available anywhere where books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it's even at Costco. And then my website, benmalcolmson.com, and then all the social media, Ben Malcolmson, on, on all, all, all of those platforms too. So love to connect with you all. And I'm just, I don't know about you, Brennan, but I'm fired up for this season. It's going to be a really fun year. I oh, can't wait. Um, <laughs> it's going to be an amazing, really fun. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. That's the fun part. It's just kind of, it's going to be eventful. And, you know, you talk about that underdog mentality. I think the Seahawks, just judging by what many people in the media think of the team this year, you know, we see yeah. the predictions of them going four and 12, five and 11. And I, it, it feels like we have that kind of underdog team that uh, I think we've, as fans, have been embraced in the past. Yeah, that's where we thrive. That's that's why 2013 was so fun when you guys started this podcast and that Super Bowl year of I mean, all the way through that year we were the underdogs, you know, and and we were an incredible team but just continually counted out and oh the Niners are going to beat them in the NFC Championship game and oh the Broncos best offense in the history of football they're going to destroy the Seahawks and time after time that's when this team shines. And so it's going to be fun to to watch this year especially with our division really picking up, but that's, that's when coach Carroll and these guys really thrive is when, when the cards are stacked against them and everyone's picking against them. It's going to be really fun to watch. We're looking forward to watching it, Ben. And uh, I will put a link in the show notes as well for a link to the, the book on Amazon. And thanks once again for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Brennan. Really appreciate it. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Well, big thanks to Ben Malcolmson for coming on the show, sharing his story, man. I, I just can't get over how fired up I am for the football season to start. We're going to the Colts game. We're going to be there. I know a, a few of our members of the flock are going to be there as well. This is going to be a fun time. It's going to be a great time. Definitely hit us up uh, if you're going to be around the stadium uh, game day. Uh, we'd love to see as many people as we can. It's always such a ball uh, meeting up with all the other little flockers, man. Uh, so definitely hit us up. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think we'll be tailgating somewhere along Utah Street, Hawk Alley. So, uh, Dude, once, telling not known. Yeah. We're going to go around and we're going to have fun. Find a spot to hang out before the game. We'll hang out after the game, I'm sure. And this is going to be... Uh, you can never do this with a frown, even in preseason. Yeah, man. It's going to be great. All right. Well, with that said, why don't we, uh, why don't we thank some of our new members of the flock? Yeah. We'll start out by thanking Pepper Horton, who came in with a check this week uh, into wow. our P.O. box with one forty five forty four, which is uh, twelve twelve for an entire year. That's amazing! Awesome! Hey, thank you, Pepper. Uh, appreciate it a ton. Um, yeah, long time little flocker and uh, a fun member of the group. And Aaron from Seattle came in through PayPal with a, a thirty dollar contribution. Says sweet. 
Uh, great show, as always. I've been scabbing off your free podcast for a while, so here's a few <laughs> bucks. <laughs> Hey man, that's the whole point. Like we're we're like a really good heroin dealer. Like we'll 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 let you have it for free for a bit. You, you, once you're hooked, then you know kind of kind of pony up for this addiction. <laughs> well, at least maybe make you feel a little guilty after after a year or two. Oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, trust me. Uh, the uh, guilt trip uh, narrative that is something I learned well from my mother, and I'm good at it. So, well, you know, we are coming up on uh, th- on on our uh, five year anniversary of doing this show. Correct. So, you know, if, if if it's been five years and, and you feel like you're into the show pretty deep, uh, now would be a good time. Yeah, definitely. Help us celebrate our anniversary. Yeah, we're trying to get to uh, 300 for the start of the season. Is that the 9th? August 9th? Is that our anniversary? What's the date? I don't know, dude. It's August something. <laughs> it's like the 9th or the 8th or some crap like that. Somewhere right there. We'll look it up. Well, the cool thing is, is that we're not only is it our five year anniversary, but our next show is going to be episode 212. Yes. Yes. So if we could get the 300 little flockers on our fifth pot anniversary. Yeah. And uh, all that, that would be amazing. One thing that I'm going to do, Aaron from Seattle with the, with the $30 uh, the donation through PayPal. I'm going to say, if you don't want to do Patreon for a, a monthly subscription, that's usually the number that we go by for, for the 300 uh, mm-hmm. that we're looking for. If you want to come in some other way, if it's just, you know, a one-time deal like Aaron, uh, if you do that 12 and above, then, then I will count that toward our 300 members of the flock for this year. Heck yeah. Where, where, where would you say we stand right now? We are at, uh, if you go to getintheflock.com, we're at 261 there. Ooh. We've got four people on PayPal subscriptions. So mm-hmm. that brings us up to 265. Uh, if we count Pepper and Aaron for the one time, that's 267. And then we have people coming in with the anonymous subscriptions through our podcast app. Uh, we've got five of those. So we're sitting at about, uh, what, what's that, about 270? 270. So all we need is 30 of you freaking freeloaders <laughs> to start uh, donating and become a little flocker. Just a dollar a month gets us there. Yeah. And the whole point of us getting to 300 was the idea that if we got to there, then we would start doing post game shows. They won't be hour and a half or none of that nonsense. I mean, maybe they will sometimes, but we don't you know, know how at least long 20, 30 minutes. At least 20 minutes. I promise, I promise you, I'm going to be hammered. So <laughs> it's going to be funny, like every show. If you guys get us there, uh, and especially if you do it, give us the privilege of having that number come to fruition uh, on show 212 on our fifth pot anniversary, we'll start doing post game shows, man. And uh, that'll be a really good time. Looking forward to it. And uh, thanks to Aaron. Uh, email continues. Thirty-six million for thirty-three-year-old Dwayne Brown sounds mildly uncomfortable. Is a part of Solari's coaching theory to hope for at least two of the three years on his legs and somehow use that leadership to transform, God willing, Effetti into a functioning pancake maker. We've had Tom Cable for so long that I don't know what a normal O line feels like for age and contract pricing. <laughs> Do you think Solari <laughs> is driving more signings like this in the future? From Aaron, uh, yeah, Aaron, uh, he, he clearly on the same page that we are with with all this, with the same sort of thoughts. You know, uh, the idea being like, yeah, you're hoping to get two of those three years being functional, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, also the thought that uh, he can be a leader and really help uh, increase the output from the other guys that we've spent high draft capital on. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that uh, the deal that they gave him is totally fair market price, and I'm super happy to see them make that investment. What makes me less comfortable would be the idea of not having Dwayne Brown at left tackle, putting a guy who played high school basketball out there, I don't know, a man who shall not be named, fan, <laughs> and uh, watching Russell Wilson, your prize, and you know, heartbeat of this team uh, carried off on a gurney. You know, one guy that we haven't talked a whole lot about and who we really haven't even heard about is that uh, fifth round pick, Jamarco Jones. Yeah, would be a guy to look for here in week one of the preseason on Thursday. If he's even going to be in the game. I, I just feel like I've heard so little about him to this point. Dude, who knows, man? If week one is crazy. You have no idea who's going to play, not play. Moving on to welcome some new members of the flock. Seth in Tacoma in for 1212. Welcome to the flock, Seth. 
Hey, all right, Seth. Got a lot of 12 12ers in here. Uh, Jeff Ames, welcome to the flock in at 12. Sweet, man. Well, uh, welcome to the flock. Welcome to the Ring of Honor. You guys are going to dig it. Michael Bates, also in at 12 12. Holy cow. Yeah, and and one more. E Wolf in at 12 12 as well. Welcome to the flock. It's hard to welcome a wolf to the flock usually. That usually ends badly, (laughs) but uh, I think this is going to work well. Vincent Carbone, uh, also in at $3 for the Pick'em League and stickers. So welcome to the flock, Vincent. Oh, welcome, Vincent. Oh, and stickers. The stickers are sweet, man. Uh, I've had some people hit me up for them recently, you know, and uh, they're they're pretty cool. Actually, I need to replace the sticker on my old Jeep. It's getting a little faded. Oh. If anybody else is in the same the same uh, you know boat, you know, one of you little flockers who's had stickers and, like, they've gotten all faded and it's time for a new one, let us know. Let us know. We'll hook you up. Yeah, and getting into the Pick'em League, uh, I, I I did an inventory. I think I kind of went crazy on prizes uh, this off season. Um, you think you did? <laughs> I remember getting like email notifications, like these little auctions you'd win and all this crap. And yeah. I'd be like, "Damn, bro!" Well, Fanatics dot com just sent us five twenty five dollar gift cards, and Sweet. just just for us to ask folks to go to SeahawkersPodcast dot com slash fan and and do your your shopping through Fanatics. If you're looking for gear or memorabilia, check out Fanatics, man. Do the SeahawkersPodcast.com slash fan. Order through there. It helps out the show a little bit. And then on top of that, you're going to get some good deals and cool gear. Yeah. And the dude is a Seahawks fan, like a legit Seahawks fan living in Spokane, working for Fanatics. So right. if you go to Fanatics has all the same stuff as NFLShop.com. But if you go there, it helps support the show. SeahawkersPodcast.com slash fan. Yeah. I mean, you're buying gear anyway. And uh, so- I mean, if you're one of those freeloaders who's too selfish to be a little flocker, <laughs> but you know, still goes out and buys gear for yourself because you have the disposable income. It's not because you're you're broke that you don't donate to the show. It's that you're cheap. <laughs> then go and, and buy your buy your jersey that you're going to wear, uh, and just do it through Fanatics through the through the link we described. And then now you're helping the show, and now you're no longer a freeloader. Yeah, everybody wins. <laughs> everybody wins. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, how you doing, Brandon? I, you doing okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. it, 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 you're, you're pushing it right to the edge on this, but, uh, <laughs> I know I'm having a little extra fun today. <laughs> I, I feel that. Yeah. Uh, so we do have more prizes though. Autograph mini helmets. We got Walter Jones, yeah. Kurt Warner, the, the real Kurt Warner with a C. Yes. Uh, Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas and Nas Jones. Dude, those are all for reals. We have four autographed footballs. We got Steve Largent, Cam Chancellor, Nas Jones, and uh, 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 for some reason, a Lions player here, uh, Luke Wilson. Oh, yeah. Well, that one's less exciting, but uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, those rest, of, these, the rest of these prizes are pretty sweet. And see, like when you do donate to the show, we don't just like pocket it, like you know, robber barons. Like you know, we buy a bunch show. of sweet. Yeah, we buy, buy a bunch of sweet prizes to give away in the pick'em league. And give you the joy of the Pick'em League, which is freaking fun. We got autographed jerseys, Walter Jones, Jim Zorn, CJ Procise. Dude, I would love me a Zorn jersey to hang next to the Largent jersey oh, in the yeah. podcast room. The, the Zorgent Largent, the Zorn to Largent hookup. The, yeah, the Zorgent hookup. <laughs> Zorgent, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then the grand prize, Russell Wilson signed print of a Keegan Hall pencil drawing. Only 300 of these were printed and signed. So limited edition run on that and signed by our quarterback, man, Russell Wilson. Yeah, yeah. And it's freaking cool. It really is. So uh, I'm sure we'll we'll end up with more. But uh, those are, those are the big prizes going into the season. And uh, that's for and, and we're going to have free leagues for for anyone who listens, as well as our members of the flock. And uh, we're getting close to hopefully having that set up by next week. I'm looking forward to it, man. The pick em league is so much fun for trash talk and just a good time every single year. I've yet to have a bad time doing the pick em league. One more welcome to the flock, Troy Fowler. Yeah. In for stickers and bonus shows. Sweet, man. Welcome to the flock, Troy. Troy. Yeah. Congratulations on not being a freeloader. (laughs) And Thomas Brown kicked up his pledge to 1212. Oh, well, welcome to the Ring of Honor. Yes. And as always, big thanks to associate producer Dustin Mock. You can go to getintheflock.com or seahawkerspodcast.com slash support. Yes, you too can be an associate producer, just like Dustin. It's true. Who's the man, by the way, just in case anybody was wondering. They weren't wondering. 
I, I think they already okay. know. Oh, well, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew how much of the man Dustin Mock is. Max Webb on YouTube sends in some comments. Uh, well, actually, some questions. And this fits right in with our expectations this year. Who do you yeah. think will have more rushing yards, Rashad Penny or Chris Carson? Chris Carson. I'm, I'm leaning that way. Now, if you were going to go with combined yards, I'm, I, I could see an argument for Penny. But just rushing yards, I'm going to go with Carson. Carson caught a 65-yard touchdown pass in the scrimmage this past weekend. Well, a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. There's definitely a renewed focus on throwing to running backs uh, with Schottenheimer in this offense. Yeah, well, no surprise there. I feel like that could be a good thing. Yeah, well, we'll we didn't see out. enough of that last year. I saw enough of it out of the Rams uh, a couple of years ago where their entire offense was checked down to Tavon Austin, checked down to the back. Yeah, but th- they did a lot of checking down to Todd Gurley last year and had success with it. I guess. Which rookie are you most excited about and which are you the least excited about? Mm, that's a good question. Who do you got? Well, the one that I'm least excited about uh, to this point is Alex Magoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, Shaquem Griffin, I, how is it? How can yeah. I be any more excited about, except watching him? You know, he had the interception on the goal line. You saw that tweeted out a, a bazillion times. Yeah. And uh, the team all hyped up around him getting the pick off of was, who is he throwing to? Will Disley on that? On the, or the, I, I, I don't know. I've actually not seen the clip. I just saw the headline. So, um, yeah, I mean, Shaquem, Shaquem can be a Pro Bowl special teams player this year. Like, absolutely. Yeah. I can see that. I could see that in his future very easily. I guess the other guy to be excited about is uh, Rasheem Green. That's my guy. Rasheem Green, for sure. Kind of filling in in that Michael Bennett role. I think he has all of the uh, natural skills to do that. I think he's going to be a guy that uh, everybody looked at and said, wow, really? They got him in the second round? Third round, yeah. Whichever round they got him in. I thought he was in the second. No, they didn't have a second round pick. Yeah, this is what happens when I just sit in my my Jeep and do the podcast and have nothing to look things. Yeah, up you on. just have to go off the top of your head. He was yeah. the, he was the second pick, so it's easy to be confused. Oh, okay, yeah. that's probably how I had it in my head. Okay, which player you think is the most overrated, and who do you think is the most underrated? Hmm, most overrated. I would probably say there's not a ton of guys who are overrated. Well, not this on year, right? On the defense, right? right? Yeah. Um, or and even on the offense. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about that question as a whole, right? There's such low expectations that revolve around this team. If you listen to the national narrative, everybody, you know, basically expects us to become an expansion team this year. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm not sure anybody is uh, overrated this year. Who you could even pick to be overrated? Well, if you're Pete Frisco, you'd pick, you'd pick uh, Russell Wilson. Well, you would, but then you'd be wrong. Yeah. You know, I had somebody say that Doug Baldwin, if you're rating him among the top 10, that that's overrating him. Top five receiver. I feel like it. Yeah. I mean, you don't Just in terms of route running. Yeah, he doesn't have the size that your top number one receivers have, but he runs better routes than just about anybody. That's that's how he's made his way in the league. You know what he has instead of size? Catches and touchdowns. Yeah, that's what he has. Uh, that's and that's what I'm more concerned with. He's a top five receiver in this league, and if you don't understand that, then you don't understand football. I feel like that people would pick him as overrated. I um, would pick him as underrated. He was going to be my choice for underrated. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I don't think he gets nearly as much love for the type of play he led the league in freaking touchdowns. Yeah. Okay. My my most overrated is Sebastian Janikowski. Wrong. You, when He's you say future, rated. when you say future Hall of Famer, I'll just say uh, future all time great. Oh, whatever, dude! <laughs> if Seabass isn't a Hall of Famer, then get out of here. So that's that's my pick. I don't feel good okay. about it. All right, that's fine. Because <laughs> that's your kicker, man. I know. Is it my most underrated? You know, Bobby Wagner. Just you could you couldn't even still. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you, know, you could throw KJ in there. Yeah. I'll go with him. I'll, I'm going with KJ for my most underrated. That solid pick. Well, let's let's go to his last question here. If you could have any player from another team on the Seahawks, who would it be? Who's the consensus best right tackle in the game? 
<laughs> you just want to you just want a solid right tackle. Yeah, just whoever whoever is the consensus best right tackle in the game. I want him. Well, here, Bleacher Report this last year ranked the top right tackles of the 2017 season. Okay. Yeah, Lane Johnson for the Eagles, obviously. EB1, give me the other names. Uh, Mitchell Schwartz for the okay. Chiefs. Power of the Schwartz. Daryl Williams for the Panthers. I don't know him. You got Brian Bulaga of the Packers. He's pretty damn good. Oh my gosh, number six is Ryan Ramchick. We could have drafted that dude. Dude, we could have had uh, freaking Schwartz too. Yeah, as a free agent, I probably take I probably take Mitchell Sw- Schwartz just because he's good, and there's lots of uh, Spaceballs uh, references that could be made with his name. <laughs> That's my choice right there. It's Mitchell Schwartz. Uh, you're not going to take Aaron Donald just so you can take him off of the Rams. We don't need him as much. No, that's that's probably a good point. Well, my guy yeah. wasn't a guy that I absolutely needed either. Just a guy I wanted on the team. Okay. And DeAndre Hopkins is my guy. Oh, yeah, he's fun to watch, right? Yeah. Yeah, he'd be a good he'd be a good match with Russell Wilson. I mean, you saw uh, the type the way he meshed with Deshaun Watson, right? And you know, Russ and Deshaun, you know, they have a, a similar flair for the game. I just think having Hopkins paired with Baldwin, that'd be a pretty fun wide receiver combo. That's a great pairing, you know? Like, that, that'd be a, a perfect wine with your meal, you know, <laughs> that they, they pair up for you. Oh, uh, we got a review this past week. Oh, hell yeah. In from Australia from uh, The Foons. <laughs> nice. And uh, it says, my favorite podcast. New to NFL and Seahawks, my wife and I wanted to learn more about my favorite team. After finding this podcast, our love for the NFL and Seahawks has gone through the roof. As an Australian, it's not easy to even watch a game, let alone find the latest news. These guys are hilarious and also very informative, too. Couldn't recommend this podcast enough. Dude, thank you for the review. You know, one thing that I enjoy a lot is that uh, Australians seem to get our sense of humor. Mm. Like, I feel like, you know, we would if we went to Australia, we would fit in pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I think Montana, I think Montana and Australia have a very similar mindset. That could in be view of the world. Well, yeah. I, I am a, a good portion of my heritage is Australian too. So, oh, that's right. I yeah. forgot you're a criminal. <laughs> no, my grandmother was a criminal. Right? You think you you just shook those jeans off? <laughs> I see you stealing every time you're in the Fred Meyer. Yeah, yeah. Reese's peanut butter cups. You can spot a Reese's peanut butter cup from three miles away. You know what? And that would probably be if I were to if I were to pocket a, a, a candy bar. In the grocery yeah. store, that would be my go-to. I, I have no doubts. We were we were hanging out with all of our friends at my sister's lake house, and uh, the fridge is opened, and everybody brought food, right? So it's just jam it's packed, just packed full of shit, just packed. Yeah, you know, good luck finding anything in there. And in one of their drawers, not even sitting flat, but like <laughs> sitting vertically, like in the corner, like all the way against the edge of the drawer, and like was smashed up in there, and you could just see like the bottom half of the package. And like Brandon opens the opens the fridge and it's like a laser focus. He just goes whoop and he goes, Oh, you got Reese's. And I was like, What are you talking about? And he like points at this little speck of orange in the corner of the drawer window. And like he, he picked it out like that. It was crazy. We'll have to do our uh our candy uh a candy bracket at some time. And uh mm, Okay. It, it's it would be no doubt for me, peanut butter cups coming out on top of the end. So maybe there's no point in even doing one. It can be a, a, yeah. a bracket of two. Uh, you know, just for the versatility and uh, their value as a uh, of a like a bar that you put in your backpack uh, as a as a trail bar, mm-hmm. right? I go with the Snickers. Yeah, that's my number two. My number two would be Reese's Pieces. Oh, huh. I'm way more about the pieces than I am the cups. Interesting. I'm not a big Pieces fan. And then maybe Rolos after that, and then whatchamacallits after that. When do you say we move on to our do better and better at life? All right, man, let's do it. My do better this week is for freaking Apple. I'm pissed off at Apple right now, dude. I've like, had to hear so about this so much. I mean, yeah, so much. Yeah. So much. I feel bad for our listeners, even though it'll probably be their first time hearing it from you. Oh, God, this is so dumb. So, like, I can't... St- Number one, I have been rocking an iPhone... Five, anyway, whatever. It was small, right? Yeah. And I don't want. I don't want this. I don't want a computer the size of a Catfish. tablet. Like I want a phone that I can put in my pocket and not like have it take up my entire leg. 
Now, I don't understand these enormous freaking phones. It's the dumbest thing in the world. Anyways, my poor iPhone 5, I abandoned it somewhere. I just left it. I don't know where it is. I lost it because I'm stupid. And it was about to die anyway. So, you know, c'est la vie, you know. So I go in and I'm like, all right, what's the smallest phone money can buy? You know, that I can still like look up directions on when mm-hmm. I travel. And they're like, oh man, all we got is this iPhone 8. I'm like, eh, look at it. It's big. It's way too big. I already hate it. I hate it for that. Like that stinks. It's connectivity stinks. It's far worse at picking up cell phone signals than my five. And the reason I know that is my buddy who works with me doing wheel grinds. He still has his five. And we were in places this weekend where I had no service and he still had service and we both have Verizon. So that's a BS right there because iPhone eights freaking stink. Now here's the, here's the coup de gras of just Apple and it's infinite Catfish. wisdom and what they did. I go to plug in my headphones to go for a run on my brand new iPhone 8. Guess what I couldn't do? Plug in my freaking headphones because I took away the headphone jack. Now you have to use a stupid boondoggle thing to like connect your, your uh, headphones into a lightning jack for no effing reason. None. There is no good reason. None. They're like, oh, well, it saves space. And so we can put a little better battery in it. Well, what do you Catfish. can do? Now I got to carry around this new stupid little adapter just to <coughs> plug my phone into either my car stereo or into my headphones. All right, so I'm pissed off for the whole day when I finally figure this out. Next day, I get in the Jeep to go and drive somewhere. And I go to hook my phone to the car. Guess what? Yep. Totally forgot that stupid little freaking boondoggle <laughs> as I drive to Pullman, Washington. So guess what I got to do? Spend another 10 freaking dollars on another little adapter. I'm going to have to have 40 of these spread around the U.S. just so I can be sure to hook up my phone when I want to. When I used to just be able to plug it in the hole that was made for a freaking audio device. And guess what, Apple? The phone was originally an iPod. And what is an iPod for? Listening to shit. Now I can't hardly do that. Now, and especially in the car when I'm driving down the road listening to tunes, I can't charge my phone while having it plugged into the stereo at the same time because Apple decided to not give me a headphone jack. And for those nerdy ass engineers that suck ass, do better. Dude, you need to do better. Where did you go to get your phone? I don't know. The Verizon store just down the road from my house. Oh, well, take it back to them and say you want an iPhone SE. It's just like well, your old they had five or six. Order it special order it and i had had to wait like three or four days and i had to be on the road like there was no waiting yeah like i just had to, it had to be now well take it back i can't it's 14 days and i'm gonna be on the road for too long tell them to do better i might just go in there pause the podcast i might do better and lay down the phone hit play and then just be like fix this this is what you get i'm really angry about this man who makes a phone without a headphone jack don't drag me kicking and screaming to Bluetooth, another freaking thing that I have to charge. Well, here's the thing. Most of, most of the stereos nowadays, they have the, you plug in oh, your know. iPhone cord oh, I know. and it just plays through your stereo. So it's charging and streaming the audio right through that same cord. Yeah. And then it also downloads all your contacts and then it tries to like, no, you, you know, don't have to do that. Oh, well, good luck figuring it out through those weird interfaces. It's all stupid, dude. Like, I just, I want my phone to make phone calls. I want to text people and look up directions and play music. That's it. I don't need to launch a shuttle with it, okay? That's all I'm saying. My do better this week is for Todd Archer of ESPN.com and his stupid bold prediction. Oh. It has bold predictions out of all 32 NFL training camps. And looky here, number one. On the top of the list, the Dallas Cowboys, because, of course, they have to start with the NFC East. Yeah. Earl Thomas will be a cowboy. This is the bold predictions, okay? He says the Cowboys and Seahawks talked about a deal at the Combine and again during the draft, but nothing came to fruition. Now that the players are on the field and Thomas appears to be willing to stick to his play me or trade me stance, the two sides can get back to talking about a deal. The Cowboys have not addressed the position in a meaningful way in the draft or free agency. They like Jeff Heath and Xavier Woods as a pairing now, but Thomas is one of the top safeties in the NFL. They have the wherewithal to give him a new deal or allow him to play out the final year of his contract in terms of salary cap space. There just seems to be too much smoke for it not to happen. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The smoke that he's referring to is the smoke that has been drummed up by him 
and his cohort of uh, other East Coast fascinated writers that like have a hard on for the Cowboys. Every like, Cowboys beat smoke. writer drumming up that smoke all off season. Yeah, whenever you hear like a report about what GMs are saying or people like everybody's like, oh yeah, no, they want the moon and the stars for Earl, and nobody wants to give it, so it's not going to happen. So I hope he enjoys his uh, starting out as bold. He should change it from bold predictions to just bold fallacies. I, that's And that's my problem with this. I mean, does Todd Archer even know what a bold prediction is? It would be more bold at this point to hear somebody affiliated with the Cowboys to say that he's not going to be a Cowboy this season. Right. That would be a bold right. prediction. So Todd Archer, for not even doing your job the right way, do better. You failed, Todd. Oh my gosh. It seems like too much smoke for it not to happen. Todd, if it, if the Cowboys wanted Earl Thomas, it would have happened by now. Yes. It would have happened before the draft. And now that it hasn't happened, he's just going to be on the Seahawks and it's going to be yes. fine. Yeah. I mean, this is very simple. Let me, let, let's explain to everybody how this is going to work. The Seahawks are going to do the exact same thing that they did with Cam Chancellor. They're not going to redo his contract. They're going to just let him hold out. And when the staring contest comes to an end, they're going to wait for the player to blink. That's what they're doing. And he's going to come back to the team and he's going to be his usual awesome Earl Thomas. So right. for all the Seahawks fans out there that are just a little bit uncomfortable because the situation, it, I, I understand how it makes fans uncomfortable. It's hard to watch a player that you enjoy so much not in there in training camp. Yes. And it's hard for you know, just to be a fan of the Seahawks and say, oh, well, I really like him to sign Earl Thomas. And neither of these things are happening. So it's it's conflicting inside. I understand this. But you just have to deal with it and, and right. be okay with it when he comes back to the team and is awesome again. Yeah. And as a 12, have your arms wide open. Be like, glad you're back, Earl. The one thing where I could see it tweaking fans a little bit is just that feeling that, you know, we want all our guys to be all in, right? Yeah. And it doesn't feel that way when he's not in training camp. But the league isn't all in on the players. You know what True. I'm saying? The league is in enough as long as you're productive at, at the dollar signs that they want to pay you. Right. They're, then, they're, then, they're, then they're in. But they're not all in. Like There's no team that is ride or die except for maybe the Patriots with Tom Brady with a player for life. Yeah, and even, even when that happens, if you start to see a decline in Tom Brady. Yeah. He'll be gone in a heartbeat. As this soon as the business. dude behind him is better than the option that they have. Sees ya. I mean, look at the Broncos with Brock Osweiler and, and Peyton Manning. There, there's no team that's uh, all in on a player for the rest of their life. So for Earl Thomas to have the exact same attitude, I have zero problems with it. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. Uh, my better at life this week is for the KOA campground in uh, Burlington. Ah. I've never stayed at a KOA. Uh, doing the RV thing is never, uh, this is new to me. I you know, bought a tiny little camper, basically like a teardrop uh, to use for work trips. Uh, so this is my first experience in that. When I've always camped, being in Montana, we just drive up a four service road somewhere and like find a spot by the creek. And we just camp there. I've never gone to quote unquote an RV park and just hung out for a weekend, but it was super cool. It actually, we had cool neighbors, met some cool people. They had a lot of cool activities going on. Like they had like a, like this foam dispenser shower thing event for the kids where like they hooked up this big foam shower head that made this giant pile of foam that was like waist high. The kids would run through Ooh, fun. Um, they had nice bathrooms, like everything was set up beauty. It was cool. Um, we actually had a really good time. So for the KOA in Burlington, Washington, you have better life than Skip Bayless. It seems to me that there would be too many people there for you to have a good time. Uh, it's, it's a little more packed than I would like. Yeah. Um, but comparing that to, uh, staying in a hotel. Oh, it, it kicked the catfish out of a hotel. My better life this week. I'm going to give it to Jason in our ring of honor group on Facebook. Okay. Cause he backed me up on the Aaron Rodgers, uh, the idea of Aaron Rodgers being a jerk. Okay. <laughs> he says, I live in Chico, California, where Rodgers is from. And a couple years back, he and his brother came into the coffee shop. My fiance worked at. And when she asked his name for the order, because she didn't know his name, he just looked at her like an arrogant jerk, shook his head, and walked away. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. You know, it 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 reminds me. I I used to I worked up at uh, Big Mountain 
the ski resort here for one winter. Yeah. And another one of the guys that I worked with had the same experience with uh, Maury Povich. <laughs> okay, Maury. <laughs> Where he came to rent some rent some gear for the day for I don't know if he was renting it for his kids or what, but right. uh, asked for his name to fill out the little rental slip. <laughs> yeah. And he just looked at him and shook his head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're not that big of a deal, Maury. <laughs> Well, oh, how, even if you're Aaron Rodgers, you expect everybody to know who you are. You know, it turns out not everybody's a football fan. No. Believe it or not. <laughs> or a State Farm Insurance fan. Or they know and they don't care. Or they think, oh, this might be a guy who just looks a lot like Aaron Rodgers. So for Jason, yeah, for Jason, for backing me up about Aaron Rodgers being a jerk and come with a story on it. You're better at life than Skip Bayless. Awesome, dude. So I, uh, I appreciate that because, um, now I know that I don't like Aaron Rodgers now. Yeah. Anybody who, who goes with the, do you know who I am or expects you to know, expects no, people to know who they are? That kind of arrogance does not work for me. Well, we do have a group of people who I know. I mean, they should expect that we know their names at this point yes. because they are our members of the flock at $12 and above. These guys are the supreme flockers. And we did have, uh, some people send in their uh, their names. Awesome. Oh, I'm glad this is happening. I hope this inspires the, the folks who have not done it yet to do it. Yes, we, we've only had two so far. We got uh, David Hong Kong Hawk uh, in with his and Annalisa sent hers in as well. Sweet. David Bloomquist, Hong Kong Hawk. Ma Sheng Yi Shu She Ye. Annalisa Mickelson, a.k.a. Mrs. Doug Baldwin, New York, New York, undergrad, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, graduate school, Brooklyn College. I do appreciate how uh, Annalisa put in her a.k.a. name as Mrs. Doug Baldwin. Yes, yes, I like that. I mean, this is where you get to take some liberties, folks. You know, all of your uh, high level flockers like you get this opportunity to um, make a name for yourself. And we know where she falls out as to who she thinks is the most handsome Seahawks player. Correct. Running down the list, associate producer, Dustin Mock. He's the man. Thanks again. DCH in Sparks, Nevada. Ron in San Francisco. Ella in Woodway, Texas. Christina in Manassas, Virginia. Mark in Kirup, Western Australia. Ross in Eureka, California. Jameson in Murray, Utah. Summer in Vancouver. Roe in Federal Way. David in Camas, Washington. James in Linwood. Sven in Telto, Deutschland. Tim in Austin, Texas, Keith in Covington, Washington, a.k.a. Flocktimus Prime, Sam in Altadena, California, Craig in Camas, Washington, Christian in Bergen, Norway, Young in Anchorage, Crystal in Oldsmere, Florida, Paul in Jacksonville, North Carolina, John in New York, Brandon in Huntersville, North Carolina, Glenn in St. Cloud, Florida, Joshua in London, Garrett in Northern Ontario, Kevin in Keene, Texas, David in Charleston, South Carolina. Lisa in Seattle. Nailed it. Mike in Anchorage, Alaska. Jonathan in Ridgefield, Washington. Kathy in Eureka, California, who I found out Kathy is is Ross's mom. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, how did we never put that together before? Well, because nobody ever told us, Ross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How come how come you're ashamed of your mom, Ross? <laughs> Because Kathy's cool. Yeah, she's going to, it sounds like she's going to send us some coffee. She she has a, a coffee shop there in Eureka. I did, so, so I rarely read the emails, but I did see that one, and I am super duper excited about this. And Eureka's a cool little town, if you've never been just it on is. the coast of Northern California there. It is. It's a very cool town. Yeah. Old Town Coffee. Old Town Coffee. Check it out, you guys. Old Town Coffee, Eureka.com. And they have chocolates, too. Ooh. So thanks to Kathy and uh, also a thanks to Keegan in Colorado Springs, Pepper in Greenville, South Carolina, Thomas in the Bronx, John Paul in Palmer, Alaska, Gary in Chappaqua, New York, Becca in Manhattan Beach, California, Craig in Pasco, Washington, John Patrick in Pierce, Nebraska, Paul in Minneapolis, Eric in Renton, Kevin in Snohomish, Carrie in Rochester, Washington, Owen in Ashburn, Ireland, Thomas in Leicester, UK, Michael in Tucson, Arizona, Jeff in Waddell, Arizona, Eric in Seattle, and Seth in Tacoma. Man, that is a list of fine, fine people, man. <laughs> it's going to be even better when they're when they're doing their own shout outs. Oh, I can't wait because uh, both both Dave and Annalisa did a, a, a really cool job. 
go Hawks at Seahawkers podcast.com. Send those in to us guys. And, uh, once a month, we'll run that down. Maybe we'll get some, you know, upbeat NFL, like intro type music to put under it. I know Dave put his own music underneath it with, and, and even introduced us, uh, to the, how you say, uh, whatever school he went to in Cantonese. So, and I think he went to school in Massachusetts. So I think he's just showing off. Yeah, he is. He is. He's got that bone in his body. You know, the shot bone, but that. I-